love it every day. I'm so grateful for the book we sing out of. It says Soul Stirring Revival Songs. And that's what we need today. We need songs that stir us up about revival and worship of God. You pray for Brother George, Miss Janet. I don't remember the first time that I heard a preacher preach on the second coming. I do remember that it was early on in my life. It was in a time when I was not saved. And I became very concerned that the Lord might come and I wouldn't be ready to meet him. And uh, I thank the Lord for what the truth of the second coming has come to mean in, to my heart as a Christian through the years. As I look around, and I've been thinking this for a long, long time, and I've wondered so, so many times, Lord, why haven't you already come? But I think I know why the Lord hadn't come yet. The Bible says that he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, if the Lord were to come today and you're lost, it's over. All that's left is an eternity in hell for you. It could just be the Lord hadn't come until today because he knew you were going to be here in this service this morning and you needed to hear the gospel and somebody tell you that you need to be saved and give your heart and life to the Lord. This is an old song. I don't remember the first time Jack and I sang it together, uh, probably not long after we married, but uh, the truth of it becomes more real every day. Redemption draweth nigh. of time have come and gone since I first heard it told how Jesus would come again someday if back then it seemed so real that I just can't help but feel how much closer his coming is today. Signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes upon the eastern sky. Lift up your head, redemption draweth nigh. Wars and strife on every Every hand and violence fills our land. Still, some people doubt he'll ever come again. Oh, but the word of God is true. He'll redeem his chosen few. So don't lose hope. For soon Christ Jesus will descend. Signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes. Upon the eastern sky, lift up your head, redemption draweth nigh. I'll ask you if you would to bow your head with me for a word of prayer. All heads are bowed and all eyes are closed. 
I wonder this morning if in this room today there is someone who's not saved. I, I wonder this morning if there's someone in this room that you have concerns about as far as their salvation is concerned. I'm going to ask you right now to pray for them. And then I'm going to ask you, if you would, this morning to pray that as I open God's Word and try to preach what the Lord put on my heart for this hour, that God would use it in somebody's life to help them come to Jesus. Maybe they are saved, but they're just away, and they really need to come back to the Lord this morning. Maybe they're unsaved, they're lost, and headed down that road of destruction to an eternal hell. Pray that God would save them for Jesus' sake. Father, what a blessing to be in this place now. Help us this morning. Lord, you know you have burdened my heart about the truth in this message this morning. And you spoke into my heart, but I, I'm, I'm nothing more than the messenger. And Lord, I, I can't do anything without you. I, I know that uh, outside of your blessing and your touch, my words will be no more than just words. And so I pray, dear Holy Spirit, would you empower the truth of your word this morning and penetrate every needy heart in this room this morning. Wherever there's a need, God, would you make it known to that individual. And I pray, Lord, that as time comes to make a decision, as you deal with us and time comes for us to individually make a decision, you would help us to do that. Thank you for what you're going to do because we ask and pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you would to open your Bible with me to the book of Psalms, chapter number 8. Psalms chapter number 8, put your finger there. And then turn all over to the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter number 2. Psalms chapter number 8, and then Hebrews chapter 2. Let me set the scene for you before we read this 8th Psalm this morning. We don't know where David was when he wrote this psalm. We do know that it is a psalm of David, but we're not given insight into where he was. It, it might have taken place when he was a very young man, tending his father's sheep out on a, a lonely hillside at night, looking up into the heavens. It might well have taken place after the Lord had anointed him to be king of Israel, and uh, God had put his hand on David and given him some tremendous victories. And as a result of that, King Saul, who was presently the king, became insanely jealous of David when he was seeking to kill him. It may have been during that time that David is standing alone. Uh, oftentimes, leadership is a very lonely place to stand. And uh, I can tell you, I, I've stood in some of these places in my life where I, I felt all alone. I, I don't know where David was when he wrote these words. I don't know where he was when the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and gave him this tremendous eight, uh, eighth psalm. It's obvious that it's nighttime, as we'll see as we read in just a moment. He looks up into the heavens. He sees the stars filling the skies with their glitter. Uh, he sees the moon with all of its brightness. And no doubt as he stands there, I, I picture him being alone. He might not have been alone. There may have been others with him, but I picture him being alone. Uh, sometimes that's the best time we can ever have with the Lord when he really speaks to our hearts when we're alone. And as he meditates on what he looks up into the skies and sees, the stars, the heavens, the moon, he thinks about the vastness of the universe and he thinks about the greatness of God who made it all. Notice verse 1 of Psalms 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. 
Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now, if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter number two, we're going to move down to verse number five. And I want us to see the New Testament interpretation and application of David's words here in Psalms chapter eight. Look, look uh, beginning our reading in verse number five. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not, now we see not yet all things put under him. I want to take the question that's asked in Psalms 8 and ask again here in Hebrews chapter 2. And I want us to use that question this morning as a thought for the message. As David looks up at the stars and the vastness of, of the universe, uh, he, says, uh, he says to himself, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? David uh, meditates here on the omnipotence, the unequaled power. That's what omnipotence means. There's no, no power as great as God's power. There's no power above his power. There's no power as great as his power. David meditates on the, the greatness of God's power, how he flung out the stars, how he hung the moon in its place, how he scooped out the earth for the sea, how he heaped up the mountains and set, then set his glory above it all. And then David looks at himself and he realizes how small and insignificant he is in the face of all of that. I saw where a scientist who studies such things said that there are some 12 octillion stars or suns like, I, like our sun. Now, to help you understand how many that, that is, it's more than all the grains of the sand of all the seashores uh, on, on planet Earth this morning. Then David thinks how that the stars look that, like they, they, they've been there forever and, and are going to be there forever. And David says, what is man? He realizes because he is a human being and he looks around at humanity, David realizes that his life is short. He's soon going to pass on. Because the Bible describes the, the life of man like this, a tale that is told, a flower that fades, the grass that withers, the smoke that dissipates, the vapor that is burned off, with a morning sun. And so David is brought face to face with the fact that he's temporary and that God seems so great and so big, so eternal. And so he asks himself the question, what is man that thou art mindful of him? There are some people who have underestimated the value of man. They think of man as being nothing more than an animal, maybe a little more complex than an animal, but, but man's nothing more than an animal. Uh, that, that when 
death comes to, to a human being, it's no different than the death of a dog or a cat or a bird or a horse. Uh, it's just a death of, 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 of an animal that's a little more complex. I, I never cease to be amazed that there are those who claim to be educated and intelligent and yet they believe that the life of man is of no greater value than that, that of a dog or a horse or a cow. That, that's, that, that sort of feeling, that sort of uh, foolishness has come about in our world uh, because of, of satanic teaching and, and error that's being taught. One of the things that's happening in our schools now uh, we, we can't teach the Bible which uh, gives us the right view of man and tells us who man really is. And we've taken all that away and, and uh, so many of our children are growing up with no awareness of God, that there is a God in heaven at all. And so they, they just look at life as being nothing. And, and, and I, I'll tell you this morning, this is aside from the message, that's one of the reasons we've got so much violence going on today and people don't think anything about taking a human life. There are those who underestimate the value of man and then there are those who overestimate the value of man. There are those who almost deify man and who he is. They make man as, as the sum total of everything, that, that everything revolves around man. You, you can almost hear them standing with their chest stuck out praying a prayer like this. Our brothers which art on earth, hallowed be the our name, our kingdom come, our will be done on earth. Well, all of that's nothing more than, than an inflated, egotistical, pompous view of, of man. But because I, I will tell you, man, man, is, man, is, not, man, is, man is not divine Amen. and has no power over anything. All the power man has is what God has put in his hands. There are those who underestimate the value of man. There are those who overestimate the value of man. And in between all of that is what the Bible says about man. And that's what I want us to look at from God's word here this morning. In Hebrews chapter 2, we find what the Bible says man is. There are three words out of the text that I've read this morning that uh, come to my mind as I think about man. The first word is glory. We'll look at that, man's glory. The second word is guilt, man's guilt. We'll talk about that. And the and third word is grace. And man can be changed by grace. And we'll talk about that for a few moments this morning. Those three words, I believe, give to us an answer to David's question found there in Psalms 8 and verse 4, as he said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us, first of all, that man is crowned with glory. Look, look back to Hebrews chapter 2 now. Let, let's back up to verse number 6, and let's begin reading. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor and did, did set him over the works of thine hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Underline, if you write in your Bible, underline those words, thou crownedest him with glory and honor. Man was a crowning creation of God. And the Word of God tells us here that man was crowned with glory. How was he crowned, crowned with glory? Well, first of all, in his design. In Matthew 7, uh, excuse me, in, in Hebrews chapter 2 and, and verse number 7, we read, Thou madest him. That's creation. That's the creative work of God. Uh, understand, beloved, man did not just happen. 
My, my end did not begin as an amoeba wallowing around in a slime pit somewhere and all over a period of thousands and millions of years wiggle out on shore and, and because of rubbing, rubbing his rear end on the ground, develop a tail and after a while some legs and after a while some arms. And I, 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 Listen, man, man didn't start like that. Man was created by, by an omnipotent God. God made man. Man's not just a, just a stroke of chance. You, 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 you didn't just happen into this world. Man is created. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, when God made man, he said something about him that he did not say about anything else he created. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God created man in his own image. He's, he's created in the image of God. God. God didn't say that about the rocks. He didn't say that about the mountains. He, he didn't look at uh, the ostrich and say, uh, the ostrich is created in my image. He didn't say that about the bees. He didn't say that about the trees. He didn't look at the insect world and say that it was created in my image. In fact, you'll find that statement made about nothing else but man. God created man in his own image after our likeness. There's something different about man. Man is made in the image of God. We hear so much today about man's ability to create life. And uh, there's so much work going on with man trying to create life. In fact, I, I was reading an article just recently by some infidel scientists who have said we're right on the verge of creating life. And as soon as we've created life, then there will be no need for God, even the idea of God. We, we will have finally, once and for all, on planet Earth, done away with the need for God or even the idea of God. But now here's their problem. When man goes into the laboratory to create life, what does he do? He takes God's methods and he takes God's materials and he takes God's tools and with a mind that God himself has given to that man, he builds something that is a lifelike substance. And then he foolishly makes the statement, there is no God. That, that, that's as, about as dumb as a rock. Notice the words again in Hebrews 2 and verse 7. Thou madest him. God crowned man with glory. In his design, he was made by the hand of God. Listen, when you look at your hands, they were created by God. When you look at your feet, they were the creation of God. Your ability to think and to act and to love and, uh, and to be angry, all those things were given to man by God. So we see the glory of man first in his design. Secondly, we see that glory in his dignity. Hebrews 2.6 says, What is man that thou art? Underline that word mindful. Mindful of him. I don't read anywhere in the Bible that God's ever been mindful of Bowser. I don't read anywhere in the Bible that God has ever been mindful of kitty cat. I don't read anywhere in the Bible, Brother Bruce, that God has ever been mindful of a whale. Now, they were all created by the hand of God, and, and certainly God is concerned about all them, but, but, but nowhere do I read that God is mindful of them. But here the Bible tells us that God is mindful of man. Not only did God design man, but that tells us that God desires man, that he's mindful of him. Now, that's a, that's a mind-blowing statement that, that God desires man, that the omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, immutable God is mindful of man. 
If you'll study God's word, you'll find that God's always been the great God of the universe. But in that, he's been mindful of man visiting with man. He visited with Abraham. He visited with Isaac. He visited with Jacob. He visited with Samuel. He visited with Samson. He visited with Peter and Paul. He visited with all of us. I'm so grateful for that hour when the Lord visited my heart as a young 13-year-old boy, convicted me of my sin, made me to know that I was lost and on my way to hell and helped me to know that I needed to be saved. But that wasn't wasn't the only time and the last time he visited with me. I'm thankful that, that I met him this morning and was able to have a conversation with him. David's overwhelmed not only at man's design, thou madest him, but at man's dignity, that God is mindful of man. Why is God so mindful of man? Why, why is it that God is mindful of man? Well, let me tell you this morning, he doesn't love us because we're valuable. We are valuable because he loves us. What makes you and I of so great a value this morning is that God would love us. He just by his grace has set his affection on us. We're talking about man. Who is man? What what is man? We're talking about the fact that he's been crowned with glory, the glory of man. We we see that in his design. We see that in his dignity, the place that he occupies. But then thirdly here in Hebrews 2, we see that in his dominion. Verses 7 and 8 tell us that when God created man, he gave him dominion over everything in this world. Notice the last phrase in verse number 7. And did set him over the works of thy hands. God created everything that was and created man and then set man over the works of his hands. When When God had created it all, if you remember there in Genesis, he then created Adam and Eve and he said to them, You're to have dominion. You're to have rule over everything. Notice verse 8 again here in in Hebrews chapter 2. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. What that tells us, beloved, is that God's intention for man was for man to be authority, to be the authority to, to rule in this world. Now, I I don't have to say this because you know it's not true today. You you know that's not true in the hour that we're, we're living. Rather than being in dominion this morning, man is in slavery today. Look around you. Look around in our world today. Man has become, you know, you hear so much about slavery today. And slavery has always, slavery has always been an awful, terrible thing. God, God never condones slavery anywhere. But I, I want to tell you, you, don't, you, you hear all this, all this stuff about reparations for what happened in days past. Pay these people because of this, that, and the other. And, and I, I probably had, had relatives who were slaves, and so did you. You don't, have to, you don't have to have a skin color of black to come from a slavery background. But I will tell you what's even worse than that is, is where we are in America today when so many people are not in slavery to other human beings necessarily, but they're in slavery to sin and Satan in this world. God never planned it to be that way. When God made man, he made him with a beautiful design. God God created man with a glorious dignity. He gave to man his marvelous dominion. Man was created to rule. What is man, David said, uh, that thou art mindful of him? Well, we see, first of all, that man is crowned with glory. Secondly, we look here in Hebrews chapter 2, and the scene changes. We move from a scene of glory to a scene of darkness. Man is charged with guilt. Look back at verse number 8 in Hebrews 2. Look at that last phrase in the verse. But now we see not yet all things put under him. What happened? What happened between the first part of verse number 8 and that last phrase in verse number 8? I'll tell you what happened. Man forfeited. Man Gave up his dominion. 
Notice what man lost. When Adam, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his own image. The reason he did that was so that he could have fellowship with them. I, I can't have fellowship with the lights in this building. I'm glad the lights are on this morning, but I, I can't fellowship with these lights this morning. We don't have anything in common at all. I, I'm thankful for the benefit most of the time of cell phones. But I can't, I can't fellowship with my cell phone. Now, I do wonder about some people today when I see them. They, they can't even sit down and eat lunch with their family and talk to each other without having their dumb cell phone in their hand, texting, doing all that kind of stuff. I have to wonder about their intelligence. That, that, that's a bad sign when you get, get to work. You can't talk to people. And I worry about our young people today. Hello? Let, let me just go ahead and say it like this. I worry much about our young people today because they don't know how to talk to each other. All they know how to do is get on this crazy cell phone. And people say things here and put things on their social media that they never dare, dare say in front of somebody. You ought never to put anything in a, in a text on this phone that you wouldn't say personal to somebody. You ought never put anything on social media that you wouldn't say personal to somebody. I can't fellowship with this cell phone. Why? Because we don't have anything in common. I, I can't fellowship with my truck sitting up there in the parking lot. We don't have well, listen, we don't have anything in common. It, it's not made like I'm made. I can have fellowship with Brother Tom and, and, and Brother Steve and Brother Lynn and Brother Larry and, and uh, uh, most of the time with Brother Bruce. I, I can't have fellowship because we have some things in common. We're, we're, we're on the same wavelength. We're alike. Are you with me? We belong to flesh and blood. So when God made us, God made us in His image, not His fleshly image. God doesn't have a fleshly image. God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. But, but I can fellowship with Him in His spiritual image. He gave, he gave me something uh, akin to his spiritual image, the spirit of God that lives within me. God said something about man that he didn't say about anything in the rest of his creation. In the image of God created he them, male and female. Now if you don't have that marked in your Bible, you ought to go ahead and mark that in your Bible because God didn't make, make any mistakes when he made some, some males and some females, okay? The reason he did that was so that he might have fellowship with us. In order for, for God to make us like himself, he had to give us a choice. You see, the choice you have, being able to make a choice in life it's a part of being like God. Listen, the only reason you can choose to be loyal is because God created you with the ability to choose not to be loyal. The only reason you can love someone is because God gave you the ability to choose not to love someone. He didn't create us as robots. God took a great risk with us when he gave us a choice or, or the ability to choose. Why did he do that? Because he wanted us to make a choice to love him. What good is it being a God of love if there's no one to love? And since God wants to love you, he wants to love someone like him, someone who can choose to love him. That's why God didn't make us robots. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can illustrate it. Suppose one of my children did not love me. We'll take Christy since she's here this morning. And we'll use her as an example. Suppose she didn't love me. Now she does love me very much. I, let me say that right up front. I thank the Lord for that. She does love me. But, but for illustration, let's suppose she did not love me. Let's suppose she said, I don't love you. I, I, I can't stand you. I don't love you. What if I studied the art of hypnotism? And I learned to hypnotize people and, 
And, and I said to her, Christy, come and, and sit down here with me. And, and I used a very subtle means of hypnotizing her. And you know, these hypnotists do all kinds of things. I, by the way, I would never, never, never under any circumstances advise anybody to get involved with anyone who does this sort of thing. Let me make clear of that this morning because you open your mind up to the devil and everything else. You get involved with this. But don't, don't for a moment, don't for a moment think that it's not real because it is. Let's suppose I'd learned how to do that. And I set her in front of me and I hypnotized her. And then I said to her, you love daddy. Honey, you love daddy. You, you really love daddy. I, I want you to get that in your mind. Say it. You love daddy. Daddy, I love you. Say it again. Daddy, I love you. And after a while, I, I brought her out of the, hip, the, the, the spell, the hypnotist spell, and the first thing she said to me was, Daddy, I love you. What good is that to me? What kind of value is that to me? I mean, I hypnotized her and, and messed with her mind and got her to say, of what value is that? With, with, with some kind of outside power, I have forced her to love me. God is not going to force you to love him. That's not what he wants. God wants you to voluntarily love him. And I say to you this morning, how could you not love him realizing what he did for you on Calvary? Amen. But he wants you to love him because you choose to love him. That's the reason God created man in his own image and gave to him a choice. But you know what happened. Man made the wrong choice and man sinned. He disobeyed God. He turned away from God. And now man who was crowned with glory is charged with guilt. And that image of God that he was created with has been defaced. It has been marred. It has been scarred. So sometimes you hear people talk about mankind being in the image of God. Well, let me just tell you something this morning. The truth is today, mankind is not created in the image of God today. Man in the Garden of Eden was created in the image of God, but mankind today is not in the image of God. You say, prove that to me. Well, turn with me to Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 3. It's just as clear as the nose on your face there. Adam, who was in the image of God, disobeyed God. But notice what happens after the fall. The Bible says that Adam brought forth a son after whose likeness? His likeness and in his image. No longer is the image of God prevalent there, but now the image of man is there. And today after Adam's fall, we're all in the image of Adam. And because of that, rather than being a little lower than the angels... We're a little lower than the animals. I mean, man does things today with his super intelligence that, that an animal could not or, or, or would not even do. You've heard the little story about the monkeys, too. I've been sitting in a coconut tree, and they were discussing evolution and all the terrible things that, that human beings do. And one of the monkeys said to the other one, man descended the honorary cuss, but brother, he didn't descend from us. Well, that's about the reality. Animals, an, listen, man's living lower than the animals today. I, I sympathize with the monkey, and, and, and certainly we ought not blame all the mess of humanity on, on the animal world today. Somebody said man's problem is that his mental power has outrun his moral breaks, and he has the ability to do things that no self-respecting animal would do. The reason man has become a little lower than the animals is because he's spiritually depraved. He's separated from God. He's now charged with guilt. Sure, a man has great ability. Not only does he have great ability, but he's got great capability. We can make jet airplanes that fly faster than you can even think about this morning, but what are we doing with them? We've made bombers out of them. We kill people with them. Man has discovered atomic energy, but what has he done with it? He turned it into horrific weapons of death and, and destruction. Man discovers television and, and computers and all that, but what does he do with them? He's filled them with filth and violence and pornography. That's what man has lost. 
He lost the, the image of God. He lost the dominion that God intended for him to have when man was created in the Garden of Eden. Not only we see what man lost, but we see what Christ regained. Look back there in, in Psalms chapter 8 at verses 6, 7, and 8. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. That's what God made man to have dominion over. If you and I were where we ought to be this morning, we'd have dominion over the beast. We'd have dominion over the fowls. We'd have dominion over the fish of the sea. We don't have that, but... but all you've got to do is look into the New Testament at the Lord Jesus Christ and we, we, we see how the Lord Jesus had dominion over all those things. He regained what man had lost. You remember when our Lord was going into Jerusalem on the day of his triumphal entry? Mark chapter 11, Luke chapter 19. He told his disciples, I want you to go get a donkey where, where on never a man sat before. I want you to go get an unbroken donkey. And they found that donkey and, and brought it to Jesus. And Jesus rode that unbroken donkey into the city of Jerusalem. I'd like to see you try to do that. Kids, kids, kids today don't want kind of fun we had when we were growing up. How many of you ever went to a donkey basketball game? Raise your hand. How many of you know what a donkey basketball game is all about? There's a few intelligent folks here this morning. Miss Janet knows. But she ain't going to try to ride the donkey no more. Nobody else in their right mind try to ride that donkey. I tell you, because them dudes standing around with them shocker sticks, and about the time you get on, and here you go. But Jesus got on that donkey, and, and that donkey just peacefully strode into Jerusalem. So happy that he was carrying the Prince of Life, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He had dominion over the beast of the field. What about the fowls of the air? Do you remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter? Matthew 26, verse 34, Before the cock crows, you'll deny me thrice. Read the story. Look, look at what happened when Jesus was taken uh, by, by, the, by, by the scribes and Pharisees and taken in, uh, to, to be taken in to Pilate. Peter denied the Lord once, no crowing. He denied the Lord twice, still no crowing. But the third time Peter denied the Lord and even cursed, the old rooster began to crow. Right on time. Jesus had power over the beast of the field, over the fowl of the air. Do you remember when Jesus needed to pay his taxes? Time came for tax time. And he said to Peter, cast a hook. And take up the fish that first cometh, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. That's exactly what Peter did. Took money out of the fish's mouth and went and paid their taxes. Jesus had dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and the beasts of the air. That's what man lost. Man lost all that. He was guilty as charged. He disobeyed God. He, he turned against the, the, the creation, turned against the creator. And he lost everything God had created him for. Lost his design, lost his dignity, lost his dominion. What is man that thou art mindful of him? The third thing the writer of Hebrews tells us about man is how it can be changed by grace. Look at verse number nine. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. We got that little hinge word. I, I call that little word but a hinge word. It's, a, it's always a hinge word in, in the Bible. You need to, wherever you find that little word but, you, you need to look at what's being said there. But there's a change of things that's going on. Man's been charged and is guilty in the verses just before verse number nine. But man is guilty. He's lost his dignity. He, he's lost his design. He's lost his dominion. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor 
that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Listen to me and I'm done. If you, if you don't see Jesus and everything that I've tried to say here this morning that, that I might as well have been out there talking to the brick wall. If you don't see Jesus as the answer to every need that man has this morning then there's no hope for you whatsoever. There's a word in the latter part of verse number 9 that you need to have underlined. It is one of the great words to be found in God's word. It is the word grace. You see, there's only one way for man to be changed, and that's by the grace of God. You need to understand that it was in human flesh that sin came into the world. And therefore, it has to be human flesh that sin is, is removed. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for just a minute. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 21 and 22. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since by sin, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The first man, Adam, ruined us. Adam disobeyed God, plunged the entirety of the human race into sin. He ruined us. The last man, Jesus, redeemed us. The, the scripture that we read here in Psalms 8 and Hebrews 2 gives us the reason and the philosophy behind the fact that God became a man. Why didn't God just look down from heaven and say, I want to forgive man? I, I want to overlook man's sin. Let, let's, let, let's, let's just save everybody. Let, let's just take everybody to heaven. Why did Jesus have to come to earth? Why did he have to become flesh? Why did he have to take up on himself flesh and blood and die on the cross? Well, the writer of Hebrews gives us the reason here. First of all, to suffer as a man. Since it was as man we lost our salvation as man we sin, it's also as man that Jesus suffered. Jesus became a man so he could suffer. He could not have suffered as God is in heaven. Nothing can inflict pain upon God in heaven. He's God. He's omnipotent. He's above all things. Sin causes suffering. There, there, there's no way that God uh, can let sin go unpunished. He never has and he never will. There's no such thing as sin unpunished. When God forgives us, he doesn't just overlook our sin. He never will overlook our sin. Sin causes suffering. If you're bound to sin, then you are bound to suffer. Remember this. Mark it down in your mind. Your sin will be pardoned in Christ or your sin will be punished in hell. But your sin is going to be punished in order for the Lord Jesus to remove that suffering from us then he had to take that suffering upon himself. And again, he couldn't stay in heaven and do that. He had to become man. So he came to Bethlehem's manger, to the womb of Mary, was born uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as the God-man, God in the flesh, as much God as he was man, as much man as he was God. But he did that in order to suffer for my sins and yours. He had to be made a little lower than the angels himself. On the cross, our Lord suffered in agony, shedding his blood as a human being. He came from the throne room of heaven to a stable and then was hung on a wooden cross. They nailed his hands and his feet. They bruised his brow with a crown of thorns. The Roman soldier put a spear in his side. He suffered as a man because that's what the penalty for sin is. Suffering, death, he died. Jesus, somebody said, he, no, he didn't swoon on the cross. He didn't faint. He died on the cross. Why? Because God demanded death as a payment for sin. And your, your sin will be pardoned in Christ or to be punished in hell, one or the other. You, you've got to make that choice in your life whether I'm going to accept his forgiveness through the work of Christ at Calvary or whether I'm going to plunge into hell and suffer for all eternity for my sin. Not only 
not only did he suffer as a man, but he came to subdue as a man. Look on down in chapter 2 of, of, uh, of, of Hebrews chapter 2 at verses 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. And if Jesus is going to take my punishment, then he had to die. God said the wages of sin is death. In order for Jesus to take my punishment, he had to die. And the only way he could die was to become a man. The writer of Hebrews tells us what he accomplished in his death. He destroyed the devil. He delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. No longer do we have to be in bondage to death or the fear of death. Why? Because Jesus as a man suffered and Jesus as a man subdued the devil. He, he pulled on Slewfoot's fangs. The devil has no power. The only power Satan has this morning is the power you yield to him, the power you give to him in your life. Our Lord came to suffer as a man. He came to subdue as a man, but then lastly he came to sympathize as a man. Look at verses 17 and 18 of this second chapter. To the most precious verses in all the Bible. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Do you know what that means? Do, do you have a clue what that means this morning? That just simply means he understands you. He, he understands you. He knows about your life this morning. He knows where you have been. He knows what you have done. He knows what you have been through. He knows all the terrible mistakes and sins that you've... He knows about all those things this morning. He was made a little lower than the angels that, that he might understand what we're going through. Remember when he went into the wilderness, tempted of the devil for 40 days? I didn't say that he condones what we're going through. I didn't say he condones my sin or your sin. But I'll tell you this morning, he understands where you are in your life. I'll tell you this morning, there have been some times as I've tried to be a pastor over these last 40 plus years that I've sat and listened to folks pour out their heart and talk about the difficulty that they were going through in their life. And though I, I always try to listen to their broken heart and always try to pray for them, there, there have been so many times I, I did not know what they were going through because I had never been there. I had not been in their shoes. But thank God this morning there's one who understands the sympathizing Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.15, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Aren't you thankful this morning for such a Savior? What is man, David said, that thou art mindful of him? Man was crowned by glory. He was charged with guilt. But thank God, he can be changed by grace. Here is a man changed by the grace of God. How can that take us? How, how can a man be changed by the grace of God? Well, the Bible tells us very simply, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is through faith that a man can be changed by grace. God doesn't just have a magic wand in heaven that he waves over people and changes them. No, that's not how it happens. We're changed through faith. Faith in what? Faith in what? Oh, preacher, I, I've got faith in the church. Well, that's good. But I won't tell you faith in the church is not going to get you into heaven. Well, I've got, I, preacher, I've got faith in the... the uh, 
the ordinances of the church, the Lord's Supper and baptism. I've got faith in those. Well, I, that, that's good to a point, but, but faith in those things is not going to get you in that. Well, I, I, I preach your soul and so I've got faith in him. Listen, faith, faith in man will always let you down. Faith in what? Not in good works, not in man-made religion. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us. That's a Bible fact. God left heaven and, and became a man. 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But how does that become real to you? How, how does Jesus dying on the cross become real to you? How did it become real in my heart, in my life? How did it become real in the hearts of others in this building who are saved this morning? I'll tell you how. It became real through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. You remember the story there in Acts chapter 16? Paul and Silas have been thrown in that Philippian jail. They, they were beaten. They were placed in stocks because of their faith in Christ. And God sent an earthquake and set them free and uh, shook the jail doors off their hinges and all the prisoners were set free. And the jailer came in afraid for his life and, and said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they gave him the Bible answer. Believe, that's faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This morning, this very hour, these very moments, if you're here lost, if you will by faith believe that Jesus died for your sins, if you'll repent of your sins, and if you'll open your heart and ask him in, ask him to forgive you of your sin, he'll do three things for you. First of all, he'll forgive your sin. He'll just wipe the slate clean. Just as if you had never sinned. Secondly, he'll come into your heart. Spirit of God will take up residence within you and begin to help you as you grow in faith and walking with the Lord to help you in your life. And thirdly, he'll give you a new nature. Give you a whole set of new want-tos in your life. And then one day, with him, all things will be put under your feet. He'll give you back that design that he had for you. That dignity that was to be yours. That dominion that he intended for you to have. All that can be a present possession in your life this morning. If you simply, by faith, will trust the Lord Jesus Christ. If I could, if I could, I can't, but if I could, I'd get saved for everybody in this room that's not saved this morning. Amen. If I could, but I can't. Because you see, the responsibility is a personal responsibility in your life. It is a choice that you've got to make for Him. I chose to love Him. I chose to trust Him. I chose by faith to make Him my Savior. And when I made the choice, He's already made the choice. He's already decided. I don't have to wait on God to have a big three meeting in heaven to make a decision about whether He's going to love me and save me. He's already decided that. He's got the recording angel standing with the book of life ready with a pen in hand to write my name down. And your name down if we'll make the choice to trust him. The question is, will you? Bow your head with me, please. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. Miss Janet's going to come to the piano this morning and play an invitation verse. And I'm going to ask you this morning, if you're not saved, would you come and take Christ as your Savior this morning? If you're here this morning and you're saved and you're out of the will of God, would you, would you make a journey back? to him this morning would you just ask him to forgive you of your waywardness and where you've been and, and to bring you back into a place of fellowship with him this morning I, I wonder and heads are bowed and eyes are closed I just feel like the Lord had me do this this morning but I wonder while every head's bowed and every eye's closed not anybody but the preacher's looking I wonder if there's anyone in this room this morning that would say preacher would you pray for me? I've got a spiritual need in my life. I'm not going to come to you. I, I'm not, listen, I'm not going to bother you. God bless you. 
But you want me to pray for you this morning. Would you lift your hand? Just lift it up and then take it down. God bless you. God bless you and you. God bless you. Yes, and you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Father, you've seen hands that were raised, you know, needs that are present in this room. I can't meet those needs, but you can. And I pray you'd help these who've lifted their hands just to slip out and find a place to meet you. And Lord, get that need met today through the grace of God. Thank you for your marvelous, wondrous grace this morning. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, heads bowed and eyes closed? If you sincerely mean you need the Lord's help, if that's not just some kind of religious show, but you really in the deepest part of your heart mean you want God to help you this morning, why don't you just slip out of the pew where you're uh, sitting or standing this morning and come and find a place and meet the Lord right here, right now, while we wait, quickly, right now. Would you do that? Quickly. Somebody will help you. Somebody will pray with you. Somebody will take time to take God's Word and help you uh, get that need met in your life. Would you come right now while we wait?